Welcome to the Council of Better Business Bureau's podcast, Better Business, Better Series, where we will explore top of mind topics with business and industry leaders to understand the leading trends and innovations that continue to push the envelope in today's marketplace. For the Better Business, Better Series podcast, I'm Will Johnson. How can leaders become even better leaders? It can be tough for someone who's been running the ship at an organization to step back and take a look at how well they are doing their job, and perhaps even more importantly, get some real honest feedback from the people working for them. Mali Ponpadith, CEO of the SOAR Community Network, knows how to help. Mali helps business leaders take a close look at themselves and their role as a leader. Does that sound about right, Molly? That sounds about right. Part of what you do, and <laughs> I know you do a lot. A, it's part of what I do, but it's a very significant part of what we do. So that's what we're going to focus on today is leaders and becoming even better leaders. So it can be a difficult proposition, I would imagine, to suggest to someone in a leadership role that they could improve their skills. Often they're driven people who have gotten to where they are because they're probably natural leaders, right? Or they've put in a lot of work over the years to get to where they are. Talk about how you approach someone about assessing where they are as a leader. So where do you start? Typically, where we start is really getting feedback, first and foremost, from their team. So someone in a leadership position typically has to manage people. And the feedback that we get from the team members, from colleagues, from peers, or from other C-level executives who are working or trying to build a company, trying to build a project together, typically um, we start there. You know, there's something that is either broken or needs some tweaking um, that has to happen. And usually the indicator is when the team says, uh, we're not quite happy. And if the leaders are really visionaries, they're open to making some adjustments because they are there to serve their team. That's where it really begins, is getting feedback from people who are a part of the team and and letting their leaders know something is a little bit off here and uh, there's no cohesiveness. And that's where we start. So let's just then walk through the process from point A to point whatever. Uh, How do you start digging into the culture of leadership within a specific organization? And I'm assuming we're talking about small, middle, large businesses. Does it matter? Yes. I think the process is similar, if not the same. Uh, The process begins really in identifying, number one, what is broken, right? When someone calls us in, in my case, when I go in to do team building or leadership development, it's typically an opportunity to change the corporate culture. Uh, But why would I even be called in? So either goals aren't being met, there's some uh, retention issues going on, uh, perhaps even the word dysfunction comes up. You know, someone inside the organization has flagged HR or has even come to their managers and leadership team and said, you know, I don't think that productivity is really at the peak level that it needs to be because people just aren't happy. And a lot of times it does come down to leadership styles, communication styles, uh, not the intention of what the leader wants, because usually if it's a good leader, they want growth, they want expansion, they want cohesiveness, but they might not necessarily know how to get everybody on board. Uh, it's in the news these days. You hear about it with, with big companies sometimes, that, that corporate uh, atmosphere and how it comes from the top down. Absolutely. And that's really where it is. I mean, I think to start top down when you were talking about leaders and how do we begin with, with from, you know, with people who really believe that they've made it. I'm a leader. I got here. Why do I need development? Well, when you have what we consider thought leaders in the picture, and they really have to be open minded and thought leaders, they have to care about this. Uh, those are the ones who truly Um, are open to experiencing things like team building, um, bringing someone outside to come in and share their vulnerabilities. Now, I will say this. I will say this. It is sometimes we do get into organizations where they are not open-minded, and uh, it's tough to go in and convince someone who doesn't believe that there anything needs to be fixed to really do a good job. So you kind of have to really um, identify leaders who care enough about their team to put their ego aside and work with the team to get better as a person 
and slash a leader. Those situations are where you're really earning your money, I imagine, where it's more of a challenge. So you mentioned a dysfunction or maybe there's a problem with a company. Not to sound negative, but any business, especially big ones or, or small, or, or there's going to be something that's not quite right. It must be then interesting just to go in and sort of figure out, well, does this reach a level of dysfunction or is this something we can fix with maybe a few minor tweaks? Yes, and I would say what what I've learned doing these types of workshops um, and leadership development programs that it really comes down to uh, to individuals not feeling valued, special, and heard. And if we can really allow each person to show up with their humanness and to be vulnerable and to actually allow for a safe space to explore, that completely changes the dynamics. And that can actually happen within two minutes wow. with some ice-breaking exercises where it's not so much about my leader sucks, they're not listening to me, and there's no finger pointing. It's more about, okay, let's talk a little bit about something that's personal to you that might be related or not related to your work that nobody on your team knows. And it gives them a chance to share something that they bring to the table and they get excited. And when you start from a place of positive abundance and overflow, it changes the whole dynamics, the energy of the room. Now it's about sharing and not so much about pushing people away or making them feel bad. That's usually where I bring up the fact that I can juggle. Uh, yeah. Something like that, right? <laughs> well, I mean, we all sit it in the same true. traffic and we all go get groceries and get the gas. And you it's juggle sort of, while you're driving? What? While I drive, <laughs> yes. No, no, no. But but it, it, like what you're talking about is that humanness. And actually, you jumped ahead to a question I was going to ask you, but let's get into it. Do topics like, and I think you've addressed this, but in, in a way, but do topics like then empathy and feelings come into the picture? And it's not always the kind of stuff you might imagine in a business setting. I imagine for someone who is focused on overall business success and the bottom line, those words might seem a little foreign. We don't get taught that. Should we talk We're, about it in business? I mean, is that we, I there's personally, a place. I believe so. Yeah. But that's our philosophy at the Store Community Network. We're all about messaging from your heart because if you can create a sense of connection that is real, that is raw, that is authentic, you have a level playing field because you come there as human beings and not titles. You come there with your gifts and talents put on the table so that your leaders can really shuffle and make the best of your talents, your skill sets, your experiences. I don't think leadership teams do that enough. I mean, how often do you go to meetings and maybe, you know, even once a week, you're three or four times in meetings and meetings and meetings that you never actually allow your team to explore or share what they're really gifted at. It's more about dictating numbers and quotas. So I suggest with leadership teams, even if you're small and you have a leadership team of two or three, or maybe you're the you're the uh, two co-founders, um, once a month at least, take a break, even if it's a half day or a happy hour, and do something that's not quota-driven, business-driven, profit-driven, and more about exploring creativity. What is it that you can do? How can you think outside the box? Because when you share like that, you actually get a lot more um, interesting, interesting concepts that come to you because you're not so stressed out about what you have to do to, to make profit happen. So it doesn't necessarily have to be hugs and tears, but no. just bringing out bringing it, things out from people that you have no idea about. Right. It seems like those situations are where you find out that someone has a special skill that's never come up and all of a sudden you have an idea for something brand new. And it could be as simple as, you know, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies and interests? Uh, that's very easy to uncover in someone. And if it's something where you're like, I never knew that about you, there's already a new kind of dialogue that can happen. I think that's really important is, you know, for me, in my, in my experience, um, work is very personal uh, because if you're not happy at home, when you come to work, you're already stressed before your day starts, and vice versa. If you're stressed out to the max at work, even at the highest leadership level, when you go home, you have no energy to give to your family, to give your children, to even give to your friends. And that really takes away something from the soul. So you can't lead with heart. You can't lead with vision. You can't be innovative when you're exhausted or when you're angry because you don't felt you don't feel heard, seen, or valued. Well, what a message for for somebody who's at a, a high role to to hear that kind of thing and think, you know, I don't just have to trudge on and be tough all the time. Like this stuff matters. I can't just sort of show up at work and, and suit up and show up. 
Well, give, I'll give you an example, Will. Have you ever followed somebody, whether it's in your career or whether it's just a mentor, wherever they go, you want to be close to them. You want to be near them. Yeah, Why sure. is that? Yeah. That happens when there is a personal connection, when you feel at a heart level, and we talk a lot about this, and I'm one of those people who don't want to just talk about business, because I think that if you can have a heart connection at work, you have loyalty that you cannot buy. You have, you know, uh, the, the turnover rate, it just becomes minuscule now because nobody wants to, to, to leave when they feel so invested and they're a part of a team and a part of a true mission. I think it's a really cool idea, and it's it's it, it's a little outside the box, I imagine, for some types of industry or business. Absolutely, Do you find that? yes. What and about the tech world? Is that is that a place where you, you know, can? It's interesting. I, I I would say this is a generational thing as yeah. well. I believe that with the younger generation, like the millennials today, I think they long for that. They long for the sense of, I want to feel like people care. I want to do things where, I don't know, once a month we go do something in the community. But when I come to work, I want to feel like I matter. And right? we know there's a lot of collaboration in the Exactly. The, yeah. Exactly. So I would, say, I would say that, you know, generationally, and also not, gener- not just that, but I think that many people want that opportunity, but it was traditionally not kind of put into programs, this soft skill type of training, right? But over time, when you look at the numbers, again, this is the analytical, pragmatic side of running businesses, when you look at the number and how much money you lose and spend on, you know, in terms of talent, people don't necessarily leave because of money, they leave because of management, they leave because they're not feeling like they're contributing And all this inside of them, you know, all their gifts and talents are just being wasted. What happens to a person when that happens? They feel like their soul is dying. I've been there when I was in corporate. Yeah, I think a lot of us have. Yes. You feel yourself in that situation and you know it and it's really hard to break out of. Can you imagine when you have a leader who sees that and says, no, we value you. Let's go make sure we position you in the right place. It's night and day. Yeah. Uh, In your experience, whether working with executive leaders or entrepreneurs, what are the common traits you would say that separate maybe a a good leader from a great leader? Ooh. Um, A good leader is someone who is, again, visionary, knows where the direction of the company or the team, and they have a plan to get there. But a great leader involves everyone. Everyone, great, everything we're talking exactly. about. Exactly. A great leader is someone who not only sees the North Star, but says, hey, we know this is where we want to go. You come up with the idea. You, with your skills, your experience, I trust you. You bring it to the table. We'll review it together. And collectively, we move toward that. There are good leaders who can get us there, but they don't necess- They don't have that openness to bring everybody on board. And that's the big difference. When you, li- when you think of corporations who have these strong, heart-centered leaders who are open-minded um, and developed, very self-actualized, uh, loyalty is something that you will see over and over again. They're like, nobody leaves this manager or, or this director or this leader. If they start a new business, everybody's leaving and going with that person. Yeah. Uh, before we let you go, I know being a socially responsible leader is something that's important to the SOAR community network. Why is that important to what a leader does? Well, I think this also comes down to what we teach as well is if you can tie everything to your personal vision and mission in life, everything flows. Money comes uh, or opportunities co- comes. And my personal vision and mission in life is to help every single person sent to me see, own, articulate and release soar, their unique message into the world, their unique light into the world. And I think that when you talk about social responsibility, if every single person that's sent to me cares about community and the world and we help them soar, then they actually get to create change. And that would be a benefit to all of us. And I think that if people really tap into what their unique gifts and talents are, their purposes, they have a direct contribution to making this world better. And our job is to help them message their mission to the world. And that's, to me, if everybody can really claim their purpose social in terms of social change and um, mission in terms of people, place, organizations, it would be a different world. And I think we need that right now more than ever, ever 
intentionally making the world better. And you, not to get too into the weeds, but see that sort of mission written into a mission statement for a company? Yes. I think it's very important more than ever with so many businesses launching every day, a lot a lot of them thriving, a lot of them not so much, but they keep trying and pivoting. I think that with so many opportunities, you have to stand apart. And the only way that you can authentically stand apart is with your own passion, with your own unique message. Molly, it's a really unique message you have here today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And if you'd like to learn more about the SOAR Community Network, visit soarcommunitynetwork.com. My thanks again to Molly Ponpadith for taking time to chat with us. And for the Better Business Bureau podcast, I'm Will Johnson. You just enjoyed Better Business, Better Series podcast. Be sure to tune in next month for a brand new episode. To learn more about our other shows, visit betterbusiness.blueberry.com. That's betterbusiness.blubrry.com and subscribe. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the Better Business Bureau, Council of Better Business Bureaus, or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Blueberry's Terms of Service.